Good morning, good morning, good morning. How's everybody doing? It's good to see you, Matthew. Bola, good to see you. Miriam, Sandy, Kira, Erica, Zoe, Yasmin, Caitlin, Luke T. Wow, it's great to see the whole gang here today. Looks like we've got a pretty good class. Fantastic. I'm glad to see that everybody made it today. We're seven weeks into this semester, and you are still being responsible and dedicated students coming to class, and I really do appreciate that. Everybody have a good weekend. How'd your weekends go? Anybody do something fun, interesting, crazy? I'd be curious to see. Uh-oh. Oh, and it's good morning to you, Sky. It's great to see you. Fantastic. Welcome, welcome, welcome. All right. Looks like we've had a dip in our viewers for a minute. I'm not sure. Everybody must be trying to log back in. Uh, we had 14. Now we're down to 6. I'm not sure what happened. Um, I sent you a video earlier today. Did any of you uh, watch the 30-second advertising video that I sent around? Fantastic. Matt applied to a bunch of colleges. Fantastic. Good for you. I hope you get into the one you want. Uh, uh, Kira's renovating the house. That can be good, and that also can be a pain in the butt, depending on whether you're living in the middle of that. Yep. You folks probably don't know this, but back in the days before TV was popular, if you wanted to get your news, you had to go to the movies. And before every movie... Uh, you know, and I'm talking about going to, you know, watch whatever, going down to the movie theater and buying your ticket and your popcorn. Before the movies, they would uh, show newsreels, and that's how people got their news, by going to the movies. And there would be maybe seven or eight uh, different short little newsreels that would tell you different stories about what was going on. And this is how people got the news back in the day. And uh, I wanted to, you to see a newsreel. Uh, about the invention of the computer. How about that? Is that crazy or what? <laughs> and Caitlin trapped cats to get them fixed. Yes, I'll bet you did. Holy cow, was that a big computer or what? Friggin' huge. And you know what? That huge computer probably wasn't even a tenth as powerful as this stand phone that you have right here in front of you, each and every one of you. I thought it was kind of funny where they were saying, oh, it can add up a whole column of figures in one second. That's absolutely hilarious to me because can you imagine what computers today can do in just one second, right? Pretty funny, huh? Okay, well, the other reason I showed you that today is because computers... Um, are a very important milestone for this next subfield of psychology that we're going to talk about. Let me go ahead and switch over to my uh, PowerPoint presentation. We're going to be talking about cognitive psychology today. Um, cognitive psychology is the information processing approach. And we're going to talk about the standard model of how your mind uh, is supposed to work. And then I'm going to give you some hints for uh, improving your memory, okay? <clears throat> now, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so, this week we're talking about cognitive psychology. Uh, unlike behaviorism, cognitive psychology is a major subfield of psychology. You can't go out and get a PhD in behavioral psychology, but you can get a PhD in cognitive psychology, okay? And so... This represents another one of those areas of uh, uh, subfields of, of specialization. So remember we talked about developmental psychologists. Remember we talked about biological psychologists. Now we're talking about cognitive psychologists. And uh, let me look at the comment here. Whitaker Benekit, the Apple Watch is 100 million times faster than the lunar Apollo that landed on the moon. Isn't that amazing, right, to think that a watch is a million times faster than computers that helped land uh, one of the earlier, earliest uh, uh, spaceships on the moon. That's kind of an amazing thing to think about how m much uh, improvement computers have made in the last 50 or so years. Uh, good morning, Joanna. Good to see you. Good to see you. 
I know, right? Sky says now we can finally train uh, their memory. I hope I can help you train your memory, okay? Now, so we're going to be talking about cognitive psychology, and there's actually, um, cognitive psychology was actually pioneered uh, back in the 1950s, and that's before we had all this computer and magnetic technology and nuclear technology that would allow us to look inside of brains. Now, there's another branch of psychology we call cognitive neuroscience. And cognitive neuroscience is interested in how human beings encode, store, and retrieve information. But we're not just interested in talking about those processes. We're actually trying to pinpoint where in the brain those particular things happen. Okay? So where it's at right now with cognitive psychology is they study thinking and memory, but you also have to have a biological tie-in, and you have to be able to figure out where this relates to the uh, neurotransmitters in the different parts of the brain. Does that make sense to everybody? Now, cognitive psychologists uh, came about uh, for two major reasons. Number one, they were dissatisfied with the behavioral approach. If you remember last week when we were talking about behaviorism, I told you that B.F. Skinner uh, didn't think much of free will. John Watson didn't think much of the mind. Um, and in fact, those people would suggest you don't need to think about anything internal going on in that brain. All we need to know about is the environment and the behavior it causes. In fact, your, uh, your, um, your behavioral uh, psychologist would have said there's really no way that you can study these internal processes. And in fact, some of them might have even suggested that they're not systematic or universal enough to study in people. But you know what? In the late 40s, somebody invented this thing called a computer. And a computer is an electronic brain. That's really what a computer is. It's an electronic brain of sorts. You put information in one side, kind of like I'm giving you a lecture right now. That information is processed based upon the programming that's inside that brain and then output comes out, right? So just like computers process information, um, uh, people said, hey, wait a minute. If we've got these things called computers, uh, then why should we start studying brains as if they were computers? Now, it turns out that computers are like brains in some way. Uh, they're better than brains in some ways. They work a lot faster. So computers can calculate uh, information way, way, way faster than you can. However, human beings can engage in parallel processing. So a computer can make one calculation super duper fast. It can make a million calculations a second. So quick. But a computer can only make one calculation at a time. On the other hand, human beings can process information in multiple different streams at the same time. So some ways computers are better than brains, some ways computers are not as good as brains, um, some ways computers are like brains, some ways computers are different brains, okay? So uh, last week we couldn't talk about the mind, not allowed to talk about the mind in the behavioral approach. This week we're going to talk about the mind and specifically how the brain controls the mind and we're going to use the uh, computer as a research metaphor. So uh, we're going to use the computer as sort of a, a jumping off point, and we're going to start to see how similar or different the brain is or the mind is from the computer. Remember, the mind is an abstract thing. It's a set of processes, and the brain is a set of biological matter, okay? So cognitive psychologists study the mind, which is a set of processes, and cognitive neuroscientists study how those cognitive processes are, con how the mind is controlled by the brain. Okay? Hopefully that makes sense and I haven't confused anybody. Sometimes I talk too much and confuse myself. Okay. Now, if you think about what computers do, computers receive input. You type into the computer, just like I did right now, boop, hello, and hello comes out in the chat bar. So, can you input information into a computer. You then process that information with a 
a CPU and a program, right? A your software, and then uh, you receive output. So when I tell you two plus two, two plus two is the input. It goes into your brain. You process that information, and then you produce output, which is the correct answer is four. And hola to you, Whitaker. Okay. Now in humans. We're going <laughs> to, thank you, Whitaker Bennett, a math major, right, fantastic. So we're going to use slightly different terminology for human beings. We're going to use the terms encoding, storage, and retrieval. Encoding is getting information into your mind. If you pay attention to something, it is encoded into your short-term memory. If you then remember that, and how many of you remember who the first president of the United States was? If you did remember that, that's because you encoded that information into your long-term memory. Now, you kept George Washington in your brain for many, many years without thinking about George Washington. That's because you were storing that information in your brain. And then when I asked you to bring the information out, you were able to retrieve that information. How many of you have ever had the experience of knowing that you know something, but you can't remember it right now? Anybody ever had that feeling? God, I know what the right answer is. For example, how many of you, and don't type the right answer in, how many of you uh, probably think you know what the capital of Idaho is. Does anybody know what the capital of Idaho is? Say yes or no. Yes or no. You probably say, Dad, gum it, I think I know. Or sometimes you watch Jeopardy and you're not sure. There you go. Whitaker knows Boise. I was going to give you a hint, but Whitaker just went ahead and spilled the beans. Absolutely. I want you to realize that we talk about storage and retrieval because we all know sometimes we have information in our brain and we just can't find it. So storage is different than retrieval. If you go looking in a computer, the computer is always going to find it. Human beings, on the other hand, don't always find the information that they have in their brain. Or maybe you get up and leave the uh, exam and 10 minutes after you're out of class, you're like, oh my god, the right answer was Boise. I wish I'd have known that in front of the exam, right? So with human beings, we're going to talk about encoding, storage, and retrieval. Encoding is just getting information into a part of your mind. Storage is keeping that information in your mind. And then retrieval is a third process when you get that information out of your mind. I hope that makes sense. Okay. Helen, it's Boise, Idaho. Uh, I would expect that not a lot of people uh, could pull that information out, so don't feel bad about yourself. Okay? Now, here's the deal. Uh, here's a simplistic model of how your mind kind of works. Uh, this is the Atkinson Sh and Schifrin model of information processing. It's about 50 years old. There are complexities in the way we talk about this model, but you know what, for introductory psychology students, this is a pretty good way to start. So this is what we're going to focus on. You're right, you can't add storage, right? You either have your storage. However, I would say that your long-term memory is way bigger than your Apple computer. In fact, we don't know how big memory storage is. Maybe you could store everything in the world. Who knows? But there are some examples of people who have really impressive memory. If anybody's interested, Google memory athlete. Okay, it turns out that there are national and international memory uh, competitions. And there are some people who train and practice with their memory so that they can remember they can do amazing feats of memory. Okay. Now, here's the Atkinson Schifrin information processing of memory. Now, don't think of these places uh, as areas in your brain. Instead, they're processes that we use. I've written them as boxes, a blue box, an orange box, and a purple box. But they're not so much places in your brain as they're processes that occur. 
and we're going to talk about this three-part um, memory storage system. The first part of your memory is your sensory memory. This is actually a pre-conscious memory that allows you to decide what it is you are going to pay attention to. It turns out that information is in your mind before you are even aware of it. So information can be encoded into your sensory storage memory. So when I flash a, a, a picture up in front of you, it's stuck in your mind for about a half a second. It's encoded into your sensory storage. Now here's the deal. If you decide not to pay attention to it, that information is going to decay and go away. All right. However, if you decide to pay attention to that information, it's going to be encoded <clears throat> into your short-term memory. Your short-term storage is where information is while you're actively thinking about something. So, let's, uh, if any of you are EMTs, short-term memory is sometimes used to describe that stuff that happened to you today. I'm going to change up the definition, and we're just talking about the things you are thinking about right now that's on your conscious plate. And I'm going to suggest to you that it's very small. The amount of things you can focus on in any one time is around seven chunks. And if you quit thinking about information and don't encode it into your long-term memory, after 20 seconds that information will uh, decay out of your short-term memory. Now, I've got a video in the resources folder this week. My man, George Miller and the Magic Number 7. Hi. Oh, my goodness. Holy cow. Let's see. Boom. And boom. How about that? And you know what? I'll even throw an applause in there. Yasmin Mustafa with the Magic Number 7. I'm so proud of you, Yasmin. You got that right. Absolutely. Now, uh, I've actually got a video in your course resources folder uh, about a uh, Clive Warren, the most amnesic man in the world. He is not able to encode anything into his long-term memory. And so seven seconds after he hears something, it's gone forever out of his memory. If you went in and said, hello, uh, Clive, my name is Chris, and shook his hand and then walked out the door and stayed gone for 10 seconds and walked back in, he would not remember who you were because he can't get any he can't encode information from his short term memory to his long term memory okay now and then uh, the part that most of you are more most aware of and most interested in it's your long term memory and that's where things go when you're saving them until you need them so uh, who's that dude that wears a uh, red Fur outfit fit and delivers us presents on Christmas. You just brought Santa Claus into your mind. Absolutely. If we have any sports fans out there, who won the Super Bowl this year? Oh, yeah. It was Tom Brady and the Buccaneers. You didn't have that stuff in your conscious awareness, but when I asked you to, you were able to bring it back up from your long-term storage into your conscious awareness. So, these are the three parts of your memory. A non-conscious area where information goes so you can decide what you're going to pay attention to. A conscious area when you're actually uh, manipulating the information. Okay. And then long-term memory, which is where stuff goes when you're not using it, but you might want to use it a little bit later. Okay. Uh-oh. Looks like I'm buffering a little bit. I'm sorry about that. Uh, the signal's a little bit slow. I'm not sure why we're getting that. Yeah. I, am I back now? Can you see me? Is it coming through well enough? <clears throat> now, what I'm going to do... What I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and talk about each of these three parts in a little more detail. For the next slide, I'm going to demonstrate the power of your conscious awareness. I'm going to ask you to do a trick for me. I want you to do a reading task. You folks know how you read, right? Left to right, top to bottom. I'm going to have you read left to right, top to bottom, okay? 
and I want you to read these words that I have for you. Here's the deal, though. I do not want you to read what the word says. Instead, I want you to read the color of the ink that it is presented in. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? So look down here where it says figure 7.6. If I wanted you to read that, I don't want you to say figure 7.6. I want you to say green. Does that make sense, folks? Okay, so we're going to read left to right, top to bottom. We're going to be reading the color of the ink and not the word, the semantic information. Ready, set, and go. Okay, and when you get done, what did you experience? Can you explain what was the deal here? What was the deal here? Did anybody have trouble reading these words? And if you did, why did you have trouble reading these words? What was going on? Explain to me what was going on. Hi, Ryan. Good to see you. What was going on that made it difficult? Can somebody please give me an answer? Absolutely, K. Okay. You wanted to read the words. You did mess up a little bit. Absolutely, absolutely. Do you want to know why? It's because you have been trained to ignore the color of words and pay attention to the semantic information. So let's go back a slide to the sensory memory. You receive sensory input from the external world. Think of your sensory storage as a filter. It's a filter. And it decides what you're going to pay attention to. It decides what you're going to pay attention to. And if it decides that something's not worth paying attention to, it's going to push that information away, and it's going to try to force the important information into your conscious awareness. Now, you folks don't get a lot of use of reading the color of the ink that words are in. Instead, we learn through experience that we instead need to read the semantic information. So what's happening is your sensory memory was filtering out the semantic information and letting it through and trying to push the color out of your mind. And you are actually working against your sensory storage's uh, desire to filter out the color and give you the semantic information. Exactly, Zoe. You had to think about, really think, really hard before you could recall the correct information. Does anybody remember the uh, Dancing Bear uh, video from the other week? Do you remember that? That's what's called inattentional blindness. You folks were paying attention to the people in white passing the basketball and you were completely blind to the uh, to the uh, bear dancing moonwalking bear that danced right through the middle of the stage and that's because your sensory memory filtered out that particular information okay Ex exactly Scott it's, it's a hilarious video show them the Stroop effect that'll also blow their mind that's a good one too now, here's the thing. Your sensory memory, information lasts in your sensory memory about two seconds. Okay, excuse me. Uh, a half a second for visual information and about two seconds for auditory information. So, uh, it turns out that I can flash a number up in front of you and as long as I ask you within a half a second what you saw, you can look at the image in your head and pick out the right part of that stimulus to explain to me. Okay? But if you can't, uh, if I wait longer than a half a second, the image that's, that's, uh, that's uh, burned into your brain disappears, and that information uh, disappears from your sensory memory, and you can't recall it into your encode it into your conscious memory. Okay? <clears throat> so, your sensory memory, will, information lasts in your sensory memory about a half a second, 
and really you can't keep that much information in your sensory memory. Now, there's this really neat experiment that they use to, to show people this. They do what's called a dichotic listening task. They'll put a pair of headphones on a person and they'll play one set of words in their left ear and then they'll play one set of words in their right ear. And they tell the person, pay attention to the words in your left ear. Don't pay attention to the words in your right ear. They then give them a list of words that has the 20 words that they heard in their left ear, the 20 words that they heard in their right ear, and 20 distractor words that they didn't hear. And it turns out that, and they ask them to circle the words that they heard. Now, people may not always circle all the words they heard in their left ear, but they never circle the words that they heard in their right ear. And that's because they were asked not to pay attention to those particular words. There is, however, one exception, and this is called the cocktail party effect. If you play the person's name in the ear they're not listening to, they will always hear it, even if they're not paying attention to that ear. Can anybody give me an explanation why that might be the case? That even though you're not paying attention to that ear and you don't hear anything in that ear, if I play your name, uh, Ryan, uh, Sandy, Zoe, Miriam, Luke, you always hear that. Why does that break into your consciousness even if you're not trying to pay attention? Does anybody have a theory? I'd be interested in hearing what you say. <laughs> exactly. So you know if someone is talking smack at a party. Protection mechanism. Your filter is always interested in you. You, you, you. It may not be paying attention to anything, but the one thing that's always on its mind is you. Is somebody talking about me? What are they saying? Absolutely. It's a reflex. Exactly, Joanna. That seems to break through this filter. So the weird thing about your sensory memory is it's this filter that you can train. And if you've ever seen one of those really cool detectives on TV, uh, they have the ability not to miss things that other people don't pay attention to. I get what's known as a mental set. I'm looking for these five things, and so I don't pay attention to anything that doesn't fit my mental set. And that's because the sensory memory filters it out. We are definitely programmed to know our names, but it's the most important word you will ever know, Ryan. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, here's the deal. Uh, now let's talk about your short-term memory. Your short-term memory. <laughs> exactly, right, uh, Lin Su? And that's because you know mom's going to get on your butt if she opens the doors and you're not awake. Absolutely. Very good example, Lynn. Very good example. Okay, now, um, let's talk about the next part of your mind. It's called your short-term memory. And the short-term memory is a very limited, uh, time-dependent uh, uh, memory, memory supply. As uh, Yasmin uh, mentioned, I think it was you, Yasmin, were you the one that came up with... Uh, uh, who came up with my man, George Miller? Yasmin, Miller's magic number. It turns out that human beings can hold seven plus or minus two chunks of content at a time. So, uh, Joanna, out there, I uh, before you come home tonight, I need you to pick me up some groceries from the store. I need you to pick me up milk, butter, some eggs, uh, tomato sauce, uh, diapers, uh, some aspirin, uh, a six-pack of beer, some sodas, um, some bread, and some broccoli. Oh, yeah, and can you pick up some carrots and some peas, too? Okay, Yasmin, what are you feeling when I start to add a bunch of words to that list? What are you feeling, Joanna? Hopefully she's still here. How many of you could have remembered those 12 or 13 words? You probably said, oh my God, that's too many words. I can't remember that. Absolutely, you were overwhelmed. It turns out that human beings can only remember seven plus or minus two chunks of content at a time. Exactly, five to nine items. So your short-term memory 
can only hold seven plus or minus two chunks of time. And in fact, if you look at that chart down below you, you'll see what's known as the serial uh, position effect. If I give you too many words to remember, you're going to remember the first couple of words you heard, and you're going to remember the last couple of words you heard, and you're probably going to forget all the stuff in the middle, right? Oh, there you go. You don't drink alcohol, so you probably remember the beer because you'd be like, I ain't buying that. I remember it, but I'm just not buying it, Chris. Right? So, the serial position effect says that if you overwhelm somebody's short-term memory, they're probably going to remember the first things you heard, and they're probably going to remember the last things you heard, but they're not going to remember the stuff in the middle. Now, some people, on the other hand, can remember lots of words. Some of you, I could have given you 15 words and you would have remembered it. It's probably because you learned how to chunk those words. It's probably because you learned how to chunk those words. You know what? Um, hold on for just a second. Let me do this real quick. I should have done this earlier. Okay, I want you folks, let me give you an example. Now, you can improve the size of your short-term memory by chunking information together. So, instead of thinking about uh, eggs, milk, and bread, you can put all those together into one chunk. Let's call it French toast, because you know what? French toast has bread, eggs, and you can put some milk in the eggs so that it gets creamy, right? Ah, uh, Joanna, good question, good question, um, and I'm going to answer. Wow, here's the deal. Uh, TBI, traumatic brain injury or concussions, uh, can affect your short-term and your long-term memory. And so one of the things they do with pre concussion protocols is they figure out what your baseline is. What can you remember in general? And people are different. Some people have great memories. Some people have poor memories. But your memory is what it is. But what they do is they figure out your baseline. And then when you get a concussion, they go back and test your brain. And if your brain is still damaged, you won't perform as well as you did on the baseline. And they use that as a measure of how healed your brain is. Oh, when we see the items in the store. Well, those items in a store are acting as retrieval cues, EK. They're acting as retrieval cues. And we're going to get to retrieval cues in a little bit later. Okay, folks, without writing it down, one, two, three, four, five. I have 15 letters I want you to remember in order. In order. In order, okay? Are you ready? I'm going to do them, and I want you to remember. See if you can write these down in order. But you can't start writing it down until I'm done saying it. Okay? Here we go. N. B. C. C. B. C. A. B. C. F. B. I. C. I. A. Go. Write those letters down. How many of you were able to write those letters down in proper order? Or how many of you were overwhelmed by that list? Were any of you able to write all of those down? Wow, not bad, not bad. You know what? Let me try it a different way, and this way I'm going to chunk it and see if it helps. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. Let's try it this way. NBC, CBS, ABC, FBI, CIA. Now I'll write them down. Is it much easier the second time around? 
Is it much easier the second time around? Why was it easier the second time around? Why was it easier? Can anyone tell me? <laughs> Sandy was still challenged. It was easier because NBC isn't three letters. That's a chunk. It's a TV station. CBS isn't three letters. It's a chunk. It's a, it's a station, right? FBI isn't three letters. It's, a, it's an organization. CIA isn't three letters, it's a chunk. And so what I did was I chunked these 15 letters into five smaller chunks. Now here's the deal. You can never increase more than seven plus or minus two chunks. What you can learn to do though is you can learn to create chunks out of the things that are presented to you. So if I tell you to pick up milk, eggs, and bread, you can say, okay, that's breakfast. Then I need you to pick up uh, lettuce, tomatoes, and carrots. You can think salad instead. Then I can tell you to pick up beer, potato chips, and Snickers bar. And you can think a snack. So now instead of thinking about uh, nine different words, let's think about breakfast. Bread, eggs, and milk. Let's think about a salad lettuce, tomatoes, and carrots. Then let's think about a snack. Beer, potato chips, and Snickers bars. So do you see how we can chunk information? And what you can do is you can chunk this information to increase the size of your short-term memory. Absolutely, Ryan, it's chunking. Now, IQ tests actually measure your short-term memory. On an IQ test, though, they call it your digit span. And next week when we talk about IQ tests, I'll come back to this. I'm sorry, my, my voice is really killing me today. Now, here's the deal. Information lasts for a short term in your short term memory. In order for information to last in your short term memory, you have to be uh, rehearsing it, rehearsing it, rehearsing it, rehearsing it, rehearsing it. As soon as you stop rehearsing information, it starts to disappear from your short-term memory. And the only way you can remember something after you've quit thinking about it is to get it into your long-term memory by encoding it in your long-term memory. So, in order to remember those breakfast terms, okay, I remember breakfast, bread, eggs, milk. I remember... Uh, uh, lunch because that was salad, tomatoes, and carrots. And then I remember a snack because that was a beer that Ryan won't buy for me. Uh, potato chips and a Snickers bar, right? But I had to store that information. I had to encode that in my long-term memory. Now, in order to get stuff into your long-term memory, you have to rehearse it in a very specific way. There are two basic kinds of rehearsal. There's what we call a maintenance rehearsal, which is just repeating it over and over and over and over again. This is not a good way to get stuff into your long-term memory. This is not a good way to encode information into your long-term memory. A better way is to elaboratively rehearse that information. Don't just think about that information, but relate it to things that you already have in your mind. Now, if you look underneath me, what you see is an association network, which is composed of three schemas. There's a schema for colors, red, orange, yellow, green, rose, rose. Then there's a schema for vehicles called fire engine that has fire engine, ambulance, truck, bus, car, street. And then there is a uh, there is a uh, uh, something related to fruits, apple, cherry, or orange and red things. Sunset, sunrise, clouds, pears, cherries, and apples. Actually, that's two different schemas, really. Fruits and, uh, and sky events, right? Okay, so here's the deal. Your memory is organized in this way. For example, if I said, name the first word that comes to mind when I say circus. 
If we played word association, name three words related to circus, right? I'll bet you all of you, I'll bet you all of you, if I wrote the word circus and told you to give me three words that related to circus, you would probably go clown, elephant, and lion, right? How many of you did something like that? How many of you wrote something like lion, uh, clown, or elephant, right? Why did you do that? You did that because those words are related in a schema, okay? So a schema is a knowledge structure that contains the mental associations that you have for a concept. See, Rebecca, we share the same schema. Miriam, same. Elephant, clown, okay, you just called me out. <laughs> right? And that's because we all have these same schemas, if you will. Now, the weird thing is, I can say something like uh, uh, clown, I can say circus, and you can say uh, lions, clowns, and elephants, and then somebody could all automatically say, hey, elephants makes me think of Africa. And then somebody says, Africa, how about uh, Gambia, uh, South Africa, and Ethiopia, right? Now, how in the world is an elephant related to Ethiopia? Can somebody tell me? You find elephants in Africa, maybe not in Ethiopia, but they're both related to the concept Africa. So the weird thing is we have these schemas in our mind, which are all the knowledge structures that are related to a concept, but then you can bounce from concept to concept to concept. So I can say vehicle. You can say red. Somebody will say red, that makes me think of apple. Somebody could then say, hey, that makes me think of cherry. Hey, that remin reminds me of this uh, cherry-colored sunrise I saw. Did, do you see how what an association network is? So here's the deal. If you want to improve your long-term memory, you need to learn how to elaborate things. Elaborate things. Hey, check this out. I am really good with phone numbers. Really good with phone numbers because I elaborate phone numbers when people give them to me. So I had a friend from a long time ago named Linwood, and he lived in Sanford, and he gave me his phone number. He said, my phone number is 776-1066. I immediately remembered his phone number. Do you know why? Because I elaborated it to two history dates. I like history dates and studied a lot of history growing up. So when he said 776, I thought of the American Revolution, 1776, right? And then when I heard 1066, I thought of a second very important date in history, the Norman invasion, okay, which occurred in 1066, okay? So, when I think of my friend Linwood's phone number, instead of trying to remember 776-1066, I instead think of the Revolutionary War, and I think of the Battle of Hastings. Because I already had these in my mind before I ever met Linwood. So to remember his phone number, I related 776 to the Revolutionary War, and I related 1066 to the Battle of Hastings. Does that make sense? And so, when you folks are trying to remember things, and you're trying to remember all the bones for your anatomy class, or all the muscles for your anatomy class, or all the different uh, uh, neuropeptides for your biology class, what you need to do is make ways to relate them to things that are already in your mind. So, if, if, a, if, a, um, if the word sounds like something you already know, show that, uh, show that, uh, uh, show, make that relationship in your mind, okay? Make that in your mind. So, when I'm thinking about the humorous, which is a bone in my body, 
I remember that when I hit it, it's not very funny, right? So it's not very humorous. So when I hit my arm bone, it's my humorous, okay? Okay? Um, when I'm thinking about my femur, let me see, what's a good way to relate femur to my mind? Femur, a femur. Ooh, I knew this female that had really long legs one time. Her name was Kate. And so whenever I think, whenever I try to remember that bone on your leg, I think of that female I know named, uh, named uh, Kate. And I remember that Kate was a female with a long femur bone. So what you need to do is you need to elaborate stuff that's already in your mind. So, when uh, can anybody remember the uh, nine things I told you to get from the grocery store? What did we say was for uh, breakfast? Remember, I guarantee you, you related those things to breakfast. And you said milk, eggs, and bread. And then I told you we needed to get a lunch, right? And you remember that in lunch you ate a salad. And a salad has lettuce, tomatoes, and carrots. And then, Ryan, what snack did I tell you to get me that you're not going to get me? You're going to get me potato chips, beer, not beer, probably root beer. Oh, French toast. There you go, Matthew. There you go. So, if you really want to improve your memory, learn how to attach it to something that you already have in your mind. He's going to get me a burger and not a beer. You know what? I'd, I'd eat a burger anyhow, Ryan. That sounds, Ryan, that's good to me. Okay? So, um, now, uh, there's a chart in your book I want you to pay attention to, and it's going to show you the different uh, sensory memory, short-term memory, long-term strategy. Go to this chart and using it. Yes, you can chunk in elaborative rehearsal, too. In fact, use chunking and elaborative rehearsal together. In fact, the more cues you can use together, the better off, okay? Now, how to improve your memory. Uh, it turns out there's a guy named Herman Ebbinghaus who studied memory over 100 years ago, and he found the first time you, learn, you try to learn something new, you are going to forget 50% of what you learn within one hour. So no matter how good you are, the first time you try to learn a list of vocabulary words, you're going to forget about half of them within the first hour. This is normal. This doesn't mean your memory is, is, is screwed up. This just means you're a normal human being. Now, what Ebbinghaus found is that if he went back and studied the list again, it didn't take him as long to remember the list. And when he tried to recall it again, his memory was improved. And so he found that by consolidating and reconsolidating his memory, he improved it. So if you want to remember something for a test, study it multiple times. So let's say you're going to give me three hours of study for the test. Don't study in one three-hour chunk. Study for one hour, wait, test your mind. Then study for another hour, wait, test your mind. Then study for a third time. And if you can study the same amount of time, but if you distribute that time, you actually will improve your memory. Every time you bring something into your conscious awareness, your short-term memory, and try to memorize it, you are activating your hippocampus and reconsolidating that memory. Reconsolidating that memory. I kind of remind you of Bruce Willis. <laughs> yippee ki mother. I won't say that. Thank you, Bruce Willis. That's definitely what I want to hear. <laughs> Welcome to the party, Hans. Okay, now, and another way to improve your memory is to use, to use mnemonics. Uh, how many of you know what PEMDAS is? PEMDAS is. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. <laughs> Anybody know what PEMDAS is? PEMDAS is a mnemonic. If you can make up, uh, if you can make up uh, little mnemonics, then it will help you to remember a list. Uh, I took a motorcycle class this weekend. I'm going to get my motorcycle license and go on a cross-country trip. 
It's one of my cancer things. I've decided I'm going to do that before I die. I'm not going to die, but soon. But in case something bad happens, I want to do. I want to learn how to ride a motorcycle. And what they told us this week: in order to start a motorcycle, you need to do go through a setup procedure. It's called Fine C. Fine C. Fuel, ignition, put it in neutral. Uh, crap. E is oh the key. Turn the uh, turn the uh, fuel ignition neutral. E is I forget crap. And then C is the clutch. Push the clutch in so you can crank it up. Right. Oh, turn the engine on. Turn the engine on. Fuel ignition. Turn the engine on. Put it in neutral and hit the clutch. It's a math trick. Absolutely. And you know what? I learned, uh, I learned Kathy Pulls Candy on Friday. Good stuff. Kingdom, phyla, class, order, family, genus, species. My eighth grade teacher, Mrs. Douglas, taught me that. Right? And you can use visual imagery. It turns out that your brain is better at storing pictures than it is at storing words. Because you've been remembering pictures for millions of years since we've had a brain. But words are relatively new. Okay? So, if you want to remember something, either turn it into a mnemonic or make it a very funny image. A very funny image. And then memory athletes, and I hope all of you go to the link that I've got right down here. There's this guy named Louis Angel who is that went from community college dropout to national memory champion and he shows you how to do this thing called method of location it turns out that you have a part in your brain that remembers locations very easily I can give you a 10-step path and you can easily remember that 10-step path what you do is you then take the things you want to remember chunk them together into items of two or three and put them in vivid visual imageries along that path and then when you want to remember that stuff, close your eyes and walk that path in your mind looking for the visual images that you saved. And you can greatly improve your memory such to where you will shock yourself at how good your memory can get. You know, you, want, you wonder, Ryan. Great people don't drop out too, but you're right. There's a lot of people who just don't seem to fit in with the uh, um, uh, education system and I think it's because the education system is good for a lot of people but not good for everybody that's a great great point Ryan so if some of you are struggling in school right now it doesn't mean you're dumb it doesn't mean you're a failure it just means that school this way is not working out for you either find out what your true calling is or go to Louis Angel's video and see if you can figure out how to supercharge your memory okay that's all I have to say for today. We're 52 minutes in. Sorry for taking up your extra time. Did everybody have a good time? Exactly. When you walk back into the kitchen, you remember what it is you were looking at. That's a great point, Yasmin, but here's the thing. You don't actually need to walk back into the kitchen. All you need to do is close your eyes and imagine walking back into the kitchen, and you will be absolutely shocked and how amazingly that easily that will allow you to remember these uh, these things you try to remember. Okay, Joanna has a random question before we go. I'm glad you liked it, Matthew. I had a good time too. The cognitive, uh, no problem. Anybody who needs to leave can take off now. I'm going to answer Joanna's random question. For the rest of you, take care, and I will see you on Wednesday. Trend where a picture of a dress, how some people see gold and some people see blue. Yes. That relates to chapter three on sensory perception. And it turns out that we have this thing called color constancy. Not only does your brain see red, but it sees red even when the color conditions change. It gets dark, it gets cloudy, uh, you put a neon light. You bathe it in green light. You can still see that you're looking at a red flag even though it's in a green light. And that's because our brain actually 
makes a guess about what color we see based upon what's surrounding it. What's surrounding it. So I didn't have time to show you this, but there's a really cool, you know what, hold on. Uh, screen share. Let's see. Check this picture out right here. Do you see the two yellow dots right here? You probably don't believe this, but the, the squares that those yellow dots are in are the exact same color. That dark gray looking square is the same shade as that light gray colored square. They are exactly the same thing. But I've got a shadow over this one, the one below, and it makes the uh, square below look lighter and the square above looks darker. And so uh, color constancy can cause people to have uh, this, uh, this weird changing perception of colors. Okay, folks, that's it. I'm going to go ahead and log off. Have a great week. I look forward to seeing you on Wednesday. Take care. Thank you.